So tonight I'm going to be presenting a project that made use of oral history in a public health context, and I got the chance to meet with current students for an hour. I was interviewed, actually, it's good for me. Um, and uh, we talked a little bit, um, well, they told me about their interest in using oral history in a public health context. So this is the project's full name. It's Newtown Creek Community Health and Harm Narrative Project. It quickly became an acronym because it's quite long. And my role in the project was that of consultant and also community trainer. And unfortunately, the project's principal investigators couldn't be here, and we'll talk about that language. But they, um, I just want to mention them by name because they were obviously instrumental in creating this project. So Rachel Weiss uh, was the lead investigator, and she was, at the time of this project, a master's student in public health, and she's now a doctoral candidate in public health. And Michael Heimbinder is the founder of a nonprofit called Habitat Map, and we'll be looking at his interactive map. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Habitat Map, it's basically an interactive map that um, documents toxic basically environmental burdens and toxic exposure all over the world, but there are several markers um, in New York. So it also documents quality of life issues, and my students are currently adding to the map now, and you can all add to it too. Um, I just want to start by orienting you to the place that's at the center of this project, and that's Newtown Creek. So how many of you are familiar with Newtown Creek? Just out of curiosity. How many of you live near Newtown Creek? Okay. So some of you have already, I see a few people have already heard some of the news I'm going to deliver. Um, okay, so Newtown Creek is at the center of the project as well as the communities adjacent to the creek. So, um, okay, the creek, just to give you a sense, it's three and a half miles long. It divides Brooklyn and Queens, and the creek is a tributary of the East River. And although it looks quite small in this photograph and on the map, it was actually the busiest industrial port in the northeastern United States um, as late as the 1940s and 50s. And to give you an idea of the businesses that surrounded the creek, think of businesses like oil refineries, glue factories, uh, copper smelting plants, coal yards, fertilizer factories. Um, so you can probably tell where this is going in terms of the legacy of that kind of industrial activity. It was a central industrial area, that's what's important to know in New York City, and it was also a significant route for um, boats during World War II. So the Community Health and Harms Narrative Project, it engaged three neighborhoods in New York City, two in Brooklyn and one in Queens, and all three um, are adjacent to the creek. Um, okay, so the problem with the creek is not just the water in terms of pollution. The area around the creek is also one of the most polluted places, and collectively, the pollutants within one mile of Newtown Creek include 19 waste transfer stations, the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, which bisects the creek and contributes a lot of exhaust to the area, 10 state Superfund sites, 22 brownfield cleanup program properties, and hundreds of potential brownfield sites as well. Um, the creek also receives by design an annual 2.7 billion gallons of raw sewage and polluted stormwater from 20 sewer overflow pipes. And further contributing to the problem is the Meeker Avenue plume, which is actually two plumes. So this image um, is what they call the plume. It's actually two distinct spots. And this plume resulted from years of improperly drummed dumped dry cleaning chemicals, and also a former incinerator, which you'll hear about tonight. So what's interesting about the plumes, this is just all background for what we're going to talk about. These plumes were discovered by accident when investigating the most infamous uh, contributor to the community's public health problems, which is the oil spill. So many of you may have heard of the oil spill. Um, the spill occurred in the 1950s, although it wasn't one event, it was um, a sequence of leaks and spills. And originally the spill was deemed 17 million gallon spill, but it was actually reassessed as 30 million gallons, which to give you some perspective, that's three times larger than Exxon Valdez, which we hear about a lot and heard about a lot. And now that, um, 
that oil is seeping underground. So the original spill was spotted in 1978, despite the fact that this occurred in 1950. In 1978, it was spotted by a Coast Guard, by the Coast Guard in a helicopter, and they were just patrolling. Uh, but nothing significant was done until 1990, and even then, uh, it took a long time. So I referenced black mayonnaise, I think in my first slide, that was the name of the presentation of black mayonnaise, just to give you a visual. It's what people call the kind of black slime that's um, at the bottom of the creek, but sometimes washes up and it looks like black mayonnaise. Um, okay, so here are the three neighborhoods, East Williamsburg, Maspeth, and Greenpoint. And very broadly, the neighborhoods selected for this project were historically inhabited, inhabited by immigrant communities. And um, it, in the case of at least two neighborhoods, I'm thinking of Greenpoint and East Williamsburg, um, that's changed in the last 15 years as the neighborhoods continue to be gentrified by young professionals. So Greenpoint um, has especially uh, dealt with the attendant problems of gentrification and displacement of older residents. It's a predominantly Polish community, and there's been a lot of development in Greenpoint, which is really especially problematic on top of soil with vapor issues and some of the problems that people aren't dealing with. Uh, East, William, East Williamsburg, also one of the three communities, has been predominantly Puerto Rican and Latin American since the 1950s. There's also an Italian community there. And Maspeth, the third community um, that was part of this project, is the most diverse, comprised of Polish, Slavic, Italian, Irish, German, South American, and Chinese residents. So when I got involved in this project, I lived on the cusp of one of these neighborhoods, on the block where Williamsburg turns into Greenpoint. And this is two blocks away from the underground oil plume as it was remapped in 2007. I moved to the area in 1997, and I resided there full time until 2008, and now I'm there part time. So at the time of the oral history project, which began in 2008, but got its legs in 2009, there were three lawsuits in motion related to the creek. And um, the first was a citizen suit brought by Riverkeeper, which is a clean water advocate. And um, that was brought on behalf of the citizens. And the second suit was brought by New York State Attorney General at the time, Andrew Cuomo, as a trustee of the resource. And those two were settled in November 2010, and they were rolled together. Um, and uh, it was a $25 million settlement that Exxon is paying. Um, the third pending suit, which has been in motion for a very long time, is a class action suit brought, um, it was uh, filed on behalf of 400 private plaintiffs seeking damages for property and health harms. So this is important in thinking about some of the ethical issues that came up when we were interviewing um, while these lawsuits were going on. So that's the context for the project. Uh, the project itself was developed in 2008 with the idea that it would yield valuable and nuanced public health information from the perspectives of insiders. And insiders, we deemed, were the residents themselves. We also thought um, equally important was that it could serve as a form of environmental justice by galvanizing these three disparate communities um, that were affected by common hazards, but weren't necessarily organizing together to respond uh, to these hazards. So we thought that through the process of collecting narratives, there could be more of a dialogue between these three communities. And at first, the project's design was what we call a community-based oral history project, which means that uh, community members would interview other community members. And ideally, these, this would happen across the boundaries between the three neighborhoods. Um, so, as I mentioned, up to that point, organizing had sort of been generally limited to each neighborhood. The deliverables proposed, is there, is that feedback? Yeah, a little feedback. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's going to get, I'm not sure what it is. Um, if it gets loud back there. Yeah. Does that help? Okay. Oh, so did you need that count? I don't need it. The deliverables proposed for this specific project uh, were threefold. We hoped to collect 50 narratives or interviews. We 
wanted to complete a public health report and recommendation that would be based on a thematic analysis of the interviews. So how many times in all of these interviews do people say they smell something particular on Wednesdays? What kinds of patterns emerge across the interviews? And lastly, an, inter an interactive map that paired audio bites from the narratives with the location of these experiences discussed um, discussed in the interviews, and also narrators' homes, if they were speaking about their homes, only if they were willing to identify the location. So the interactive map I just mentioned, that's a habitat map, which we'll take a look at. In terms of funding, the project was funded with a combination of startup funds from the Newtown Creek Alliance, which is a community action group, very well organized, and they offered $6,000 as seed money for this project. And Newtown Creek Alliance has um, a uh, complex mission to organize citizens, remediate the creek, and offer educational opportunities for people to engage with the creek um, and spend time near it. And um, the other part of the funding came from the Department of Environmental Protection in the form of an environmental justice report. Um, People who are here in these communities every day, they know what they see, smell, and hear, as opposed to someone who comes in for an hour, parachutes in from the organization and says, it all looks fine to me. So um, our parameters were that the interviews would be conducted by long-term residents, and that was defined as anyone who'd lived in one of the communities for 10 years. And interviewees would be community members um, who had also resided in one of the neighborhoods for 10 years. So we hoped that a core group of community members would constitute a research team and kind of take the leadership of the project. Um, so this is just to give you uh, examples of the kinds of questions that we were asking. Those of you who are studying oral history will recognize that many of these are open-ended. Um, and the core of the interview covered um, a life history so we could get some understanding of who this narrator was. Um, and they were also asked to um, tell us if they were aware of any environmental burdens in the neighborhood. And some said yes and some said no. And then if they answered yes, I am aware, and they began to tell some stories about things they're aware of, things they, they experienced or things they heard. Um, they were asked to consider any connections between the environment and their health. Again, some people saw pollution but didn't relate it to their health problems, some people saw no pollution, some people felt there was a very clear connection between um, the environmental um, burdens and their health problems. So all interviews were considered valuable. We weren't looking for evidence of one kind. Um, we were interested in finding out not only what people believed was going on, but also how they were sharing information. So if we could find out what their sources were, um, if they heard this story, who did they hear it from, where did they read it, then in terms of environmental <coughs> justice, when you go to disseminate information, you have some sense of what the network is and where people get their information from. So that was important. Uh, as a consultant, my role involved everything from recommending user-friendly equipment for community members to use, and uh, when applying for the funds that ultimately supported the project, lending my experience. Um, and later I developed and ran training sessions for community members, which I'll, I'll talk about shortly. Uh, I also consulted on areas of inquiry, so um, we talked a little bit when I met with the students at five about um, collaborating with people from other fields and it's very um, challenging and exciting, and this kind of interview style is different than um, Rachel's interviews that she often does in a public health context. So trying to introduce open-ended questions and trying to convert my collaborators to this approach um, was part of the conversation we had, um, but they were fully on board, and uh, so we looked at what we called the practice script together. And then at the very end of the project, unofficially, I interviewed Rachel just to debrief about the project and to start thinking about the issues we're going to be talking about tonight. 
So now what I want to do is get to the map and play some of the audio so you can have some um, experience of the project. And um, this is a screenshot of Habitat Map. We're not online, so I hope you'll go online so you can actually play with the map. It is interactive, and I wanted to <coughs> explain how it works. So they look purple there, but the blue markers are places that are mentioned in the narratives um, or places that are significant in, in um, industrial history of these communities, and the orange markers um, indicate narrators. So some narrators gave their address and wanted to speak specifically about the issues in their homes, and others, um, for reasons we'll discuss, did not want to identify the location of their homes, either for privacy or for concerns about the repercussions. So people had some choice in how specifically they wanted to mark themselves geographically. Um, so this map, as I mentioned, it charts uh, toxic exposures and quality of life issues. So right now, the markers we're looking at relate to um, our project, but you can also access other maps um, at Habitat Map, which documents everything from bed bugs to sewage treatment plants to noisy and quiet places in New York. So this map is always expanding. My students are currently adding interviews related to um, Hurricane Sandy, so you can add audio and um, things related to you know environmental concerns you have in your neighborhood. Um, so, um, okay. So, I lived in Greenpoint. Before I do that, so what we did, if you clicked on one of these orange markers, I'm going to simulate the experience you would have. And basically, we're going to be listening to one resident named Paul Bosco. And um, each, each um, marker, when you click it, what you're presented with is um, audio, a photograph, and some descriptors, which you'll see. I lived in Greenpoint. Um, I moved in there about February 2000. And lived in three different locations. Um, I moved out in February 2008. And in February of 2009, I was told by a neurologist at uh, St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital that he would like me to see an oncologist at Sloan Kettering to look further into an MRI they had done to, uh, for a possibility that it was a brain tumor. And it being, I mean, I'm, I was 33 at the time. I was, I was eventually diagnosed with a brain tumor in March of 2009. And I mean, there's no, they don't know exactly what caused it, I mean, there's, there's no def definitive um, answers that the doctors could give me, but the one thing they did tell me is that being 33 years old and diagnosed with this is very uncommon, and one of the most immediate things that I thought of was having lived in Greenpoint, knowing about uh, the oil spill, um, we lived on Meeker, right? up by the creek there for a couple years and when we moved into our apartment on Meeker, um, 795 Meeker, we were lucky to get a backyard and we didn't build garden boxes, which one would think would be necessary in a neighborhood that one knew or suspected to be polluted. We just we bought a few bags of dirt, threw it down and went, went about throwing to uh, growing tomatoes, and we ate everything that we grew out of that garden uh, for two two straight summers. Some of the vegetables the first summer came up completely rotten. Like I said, in retrospect, we perhaps shouldn't have been eating uh, things planted in our backyard there. Okay, so um, just to point out, um, this is what we're going to hear a little more from Paul, but just to point out the way the profiles work, um, so when you, you know, indicate that you're interested in a particular marker, something like this comes up. And um, the whole point of this project is to give narrators choices. So not everyone chose to represent themselves this way. But we did encourage people to talk about things they loved about the community, as well as things they didn't love, because we didn't want to pathologize. Um, only people needed an opportunity to discuss 
positive things as well in the community, so that was a built-in part of the project. Um, so he didn't get into things he loved necessarily, but other people did, and there was space for that. And people were also asked to define their community, so sometimes that appeared as part of the profile too. So we're gonna hear another um, clip from Paul. I've never done any you know, real thorough re research, because, you know, I guess it, I was living in Greenpoint, I didn't want to scare myself too badly. So I do remember in 2004 when we moved to Meeker Avenue and got a backyard, when I was hoeing up the backyard, I do remember a couple times making jokes about the Beverly Hillbillies, about how we struck oil um, when I dug down a few feet. So it was, it was something to joke about versus being scared of. I mean, knowing it's down there. I remember looking at the maps. Whenever I've read about it or seen mentions of it, there was always maps and updated maps of the streets. And I would always look at those maps and compare them to my extra maps and see how close or if I did indeed live above the... Uh, blobs that were on the maps and when I lived just outside of those blobs I then wondered if one could even trust a map of an underground oil spill. I've seen little snippets of it in the news, just a little article here and there, when it seems like it should be you know on the front page of the New York Times for an entire week or something. It should be and everyone in the city should know what is underneath the ground in Greenpoint, who did it, and when, and where. So one thing I should say on the subject of who did it, it's very hard to say who did it, because um, Standard Oil, one of the parties held responsible, is no longer Standard Oil, so oil companies, if you know anything about the way they fracture and sell, um, it's hard to figure out what identity um, Standard Oil, who it's been inherited by, so Exxon was one of the parties held responsible, but there are many other oil companies that were involved in this. So that's part of the frustration. Um, next we're gonna hear from Laura Hoffman, and um, Laura Half Hoffman is a long time resident of Greenpoint, and her um, parents grew up there, she grew up there, she has six children who grew up there, and um, she's, uh, you'll hear her talk about her health, but she's an activist um, with a lot of health problems, and she actually organized something called Outrage, which is stands for Organizations United for Trash Reduction and Garbage Equity, and she's a real community activist and was very instrumental in connecting the project to narrators, people really trusted her. So this is Laura Hoffman's profile. My first apartment was uh, toward the corner of McGinnis Boulevard near the bridge and we had a, we were on the ground floor and we had access to the yard. Well, I used that garden, we cleaned it up immaculately and you know we uncovered uh, what looked like flower beds from many years ago and all of these uh, like lilies of the valley and stuff that had been planted there started coming up again and we had a wonderful vegetable garden. You know I made to, pots of tomato sauce and all kinds of stuff for my kids, not knowing what was in that soil. We used to get, a lot of times in the morning, there was a funny ash on top of the tomatoes. And, you know, back then, like I said, I was in my 20s, I was kind of naive. I used to just take the hose, spray it off, we picked the tomatoes, crushed them up, made uh, tomato sauce for our family. A couple of years later, after we had moved up on uh, the corner of DuPont Street at Manhattan Avenue, I learned from being on the fifth floor and seeing the, the puffs of smoke that that was actually uh, incinerator ash. Many years after that, I learned that that incinerator ash was packed with dioxins and stuff that never leave the soil. You know, and thinking back, I, I was serving my family loads of dioxin-filled tomatoes. Okay, so um, these clips on Laura's profile, there are five of them. I'm going to play one more for you, and then I'm going to play some audio from a narrator in Nassau. 
also over the years, even as a little girl, I, I remember coming home from upstate with my family and you always knew when you were getting to Greenpoint, even if you were sleeping in the car, the smell would just slap you in the face as you were coming over to Greenpoint Avenue Bridge. And I remember my father uh, always uh, like putting his hand to his chest and say, say oh, put, put a tiger in your tank. Yeah. Well, that, that was a slog, a back then slogan for, I think the company's name was Esso at the time, put a tiger in your tank. So clearly my father knew that Exxon <laughs> or Esso oil in the, uh, in the creek. So like later on in years when I heard all of this stuff, people saying that, that the oil in the creek was uh, rediscovered, really pissed me off because there was no rediscovered about it. It's, it's been there. People have known. Department of Health has known. The EPA has known. DEP has known. DEC has known. So in my book, all of these agencies, along with the, the polluters, are all guilty of, um, of, of really creating a bad environmental situation, not only for the creek, but for the, the people who lived along the creek. As far as I'm concerned, they are in part responsible for uh, people's health problems over the years, including my family's. to 
describe um, some of the things that worked and some of the things that didn't. And then if you're interested in talking about it more, we can do that um, after. But I was not involved in the outreach. This was done both by Rachel and by um, a young community member named Yvonne Cotto, who walked into a training session and never left. She really was responsible for a lot of this project as well. And I also had a student who became the outreach intern. And she, um, by just the connections with her family, was responsible for getting a whole cluster of MassBeth narrators involved in the project because her family knew someone in MassBeth. Um, okay, so very briefly, the plan was to flyer three target neighborhoods, the three neighborhoods I described, set up a Skype voicemail service, and create a designated email address. Examples of successful outreach efforts, including included things like emailing the pastor at a church and then going to a service and introducing the project, going to a housing project and speaking with the president of the housing board, um, then taking a follow-up trip, going to a nursing home and speaking during activities hour, um, holding informational meetings at public libraries and restaurants. So I did go to um, um, at least one of the public meetings, which was interesting, and I'll talk about that. But you can hear just how much legwork it takes and time you know, time it takes to convince people to let you do that leg work. And less successful outreach efforts included attempts to engage Polish residents in Greenpoint, although um, Yvonne used, um, translated all the media and all the flyers in Polish for the Polish Weekly and the Polish radio show. Um, we did not get Polish narrators involved in the project. Uh, community board meetings also yielded no results. Uh, street festivals were not successful. Um, rotary meetings in MassBeth, not successful. PTA meetings, no. Parochial schools. And then one persistent effort, the Swinging 60s Center, you know that place, um, that was thwarted because of liability concerns. So it's a senior center, and the center was worried about having people on tape or the internet. So a request to present was denied there. Um, ultimately, eight people signed up for a training session held at the Green Oak Citizens Club, and I included this photograph just to show you this place has not changed at all. I mean, you should see the inside. Has anyone been there? <coughs> okay. Um, so I ran this session, and the day began with coffee and bagels, and we went through interview techniques, technical tutorials with the equipment, and then we followed this with interview practice and trainees received a practice script, although they could modify it once they all agreed on what we were doing. And they also received a technical crib sheet and a list of helpful hints for things to do before, during, and after an interview, like remembering to check your batteries, remembering to thank someone the next day, things like that. So today when Rachel and I discussed, not today, but recently, when I discussed with Rachel this whole trajectory of the project, she describes this training day as the high point of the project. There was a really good feeling in the space and it felt like a lot of momentum was being generated. Also, that was the day that Yvonne Kodal, a young resident in her 20s, joined as a paid staff member shortly after the training and she ended up playing a very instrumental role. So now I can give a sense of the plan for the project and I'm gonna tell you what actually happened, <laughs> which is different, <laughs> it's always different. So in the end, the project is comprised of 21 narratives instead of 50 that we hoped for. And the other major deviation from the project's design was that almost all of these interviews were conducted by Yvonne Kodal, who was a community member, um, but she hadn't lived there 10 years, and it deviated from the design of it being a community-based project. So we were based in the community, but it didn't sort of follow the definition of what a community-based project is, where any interviewer could be an interviewee and vice versa. So, the most obvious problem with the project was just this discrepancy between the design and the realized project. Um, and then there were some other problems that really interest me and still interest me, so I just want to share those with you. So um, one meeting I attended at the Greenpoint Public Library it was packed with local residents. This was also another early sign that people were really excited and angry and just that they were going to be involved. And this is where I first observed some problems. So several residents feared that the negative, that the neighborhood would be negatively portrayed in this kind of project, and I think this was a very valid concern. Um, they were worried that their property values would go down. Um, 
some of the concerned residents didn't believe there was a connection between the environmental issues in the neighborhood and people's health problems. And so they didn't want this narrative to be disseminated. Um, some residents did believe that there was a connection, but they felt they'd be further victimized if their property was devalued with the possibility of no gain for them. They didn't think we were in a position to offer remediation, even if indirectly that's what we hoped for. So it was interesting because I'd say this group also didn't necessarily value the narrative approach as effective in terms of policy or change, which is a fair, you know, it's okay to be suspect of this approach. And that's one thing you're dealing with if you're using this approach. People don't see it as a direct um, sort of, um, they don't necessarily see it as a means to an end. So they have to be engaged in the process, even though you can't necessarily promise something like remediation. Okay, and then one unexpected problem occurred at the training session. So this session that I mentioned, we gathered eight people, we're sitting eating bagels, we're talking about, we're getting ready to practice interviewing each other. And I was talking about open-ended questions and how um, we, let's see, I guess the example was, um, do you see any connection between your neighborhood and your health? That was the question we were practicing with. And Laura Hawk, you heard from her, she was at the training session as was her husband, and both the Hoffmans are longtime residents and they're in their 50s. And when I, when I proposed this question, do you see any connection between your neighborhood and your health? I'll never forget this, Mr. Hoffman exploded. Oh, I know what the problem is and I'm gonna tell them. <laughs> so he had um, very strong thoughts and feelings and he was ready to tell his story, but he wanted to be an interviewer too. So um, this was a really interesting problem because I don't think, I anticipated at least, maybe Rachel and Michael did, that we'd be negotiating the pain of participants at the training session, that we would really be dealing with their pain that day. We thought we were all rolling up our sleeves and um, <coughs> this unique relationship of being an insider interviewer brings special problems. So um, I wondered how could we ask the Hoffmans to suppress their knowledge of what was going on in the community, which was accumulated from years of personal experience and refuted by all of these so-called experts that had come into their neighborhood. So it, at this point, it felt that all the Hoffmans had was their certitude to keep them from going insane. And we were basically asking them to feign a particular brand of neutrality. And in essence, we were temporarily silencing the people we hoped to give voice to. So I thought that was a really interesting problem um, and an unexpected conflict. So we opened this up to the group. There were about 10 or 11 of us in the room. Well, what do we do? You know, Mr. Hoffman feels really strongly. He wants to tell everyone what the problem is, but how are we gonna gather people's feelings about what they think the problems are? So we went back and forth and we came up to a particular solution, or at least a rationale, to offer to discuss off tape your thoughts and feelings after generously listening to the interviewee. And that's kind of how we framed it, that it was a generosity we were extending. Um, and we proposed this with the idea that we want to authentically record residents' own thoughts, including this information. So we didn't want Mr. Hoffman to correct anyone. We wanted to collect misinformation, we wanted to collect this moment in time, what people thought was happening, even if the interviewer deemed these narratives incorrect. So Mr. Hoffman agreed reluctantly, but he did not do any interviews. Um, that said, both of the Hoffmans stepped up to make many introductions to interviewees. Okay, third problem, fear of the internet. So the internet, including Habitat Map, didn't really serve as an adequate form of reciprocity for seniors. Now, I'm not saying that all um, all seniors don't use the internet. My sister's here and our grandmother learned to email. <laughs> and um, so it can be, maybe some people are very comfortable with the internet, but um, it shouldn't be assumed that they are. And also the internet really scares older residents in terms of their private information. They, some of them just didn't know how it worked and what it meant. So this was particularly an issue at the Swinging 60s Center, as I mentioned. Um, journalists looking for interviewees after listening to their bites. So 
Um, Rachel was hounded by journalists after the map was released. I'm gonna talk about the timing. There was some attention and buzz um, about the map and the project. And after hearing these narratives, then um, it was like handing journalists accidentally the people for their poll quotes, for their articles, and then they wanted to find these people, and we hadn't really um, thought about that with the narrators. Like, you might be bothered a lot now. Journalists might call you a lot. Um, do you want to be a spokesperson? And so they hadn't agreed to that, and um, journalists were constantly calling Rachel, and she would, was having to vet the journalist, like basically is this a good person or a bad person, and then decide, you know, it was just a very extended process, but we have a solution for this, which I will share. I'm gonna talk about solutions too, not just problems. Um, <laughs> and then legal issues, so regarding the, the lawsuits I mentioned that were in motion, so this was something um, that I'd say I decided was an issue. I don't think we had recognized it as an issue, and about a week or two before we were supposed to start the interviews, I thought, wait a second, <laughs> what about those lawsuits? You know, and thinking about the nature of narrative, um, I just hated the idea that we could be undermining someone's testimony in court if they tell us one thing on tape and t say another thing in court. And as oral historians, we know this happens and we don't think that's shifty or strange. Um, we know that different interviewers elicit different answers, so we can account for the contradiction, but lawyers won't, shall we say it's true, <laughs> the lawyer right in the front row. Um, so they are not maybe interested in this gray area, so I thought we really don't want to um, elicit any narratives that could be subpoenaed and somehow end up harming our narrators. So I couldn't really get answers about how the narratives might affect those involved in the class action lawsuit partly because I realized it was a problem very late in the game. So one solution is to think very early about this. Um, but I felt I couldn't get anyone interested in the problem. That was another problem. So I was asking people about it, and they were like, eh, well. And so this brought up this um, interesting thing that I see in oral history as a field, and I definitely see in academia, which is this double standard of what we're doing, that we're very effective, but we're also harmless. And that doesn't really make sense. It's kind of, um, so I found these ideas to be contradictory. It was like a statement about our own disbelief that these would ever actually reach a wide audience, um, or that we would have an impact. So I think we can't be sloppy and um, default to a defense of irrelevance or obscurity. And um, so I have some thoughts when we get to the solution part. Um, Lastly, um, public health reports. So the project was such a labor of love, especially for Rachel, who spent so much time on this. She was a master's student, but this was not for school. And she was working full time. So this was above and beyond her school and her work. And the project took so much longer than she thought it would that she started her doctoral program by the time um, she was wrapping this project up. And the idea was that this public health report would be disseminated to agencies, politicians, we had a long list. And the public health report came out, and then it was a whole other job to disseminate it. So after it was sent to the obvious politicians and the obvious community members, then it was just sitting in her house. And it's so depressing to think about, and I actually, I didn't get to Brooklyn today, but I was hoping to bring them with me because we want these to be out, but it sounds so easy, but you don't hand them out like, you know, it's, you can't just like hand them out like, like a free yogurt sample on the street, you know, it's, you wanna be a little bit thinking about who will be interested in this. So the public health reports are sitting there, and if any of you are interested in them, maybe I can get some up to Columbia or some other central location, because I know Rachel would be thrilled. Um, okay, the last problem before we get to solutions and recommendations. The last problem is something that Rachel and I are still figuring out, which is our position relative to the subject of the neighborhood. So I mentioned Rachel and I both live in the neighborhood, and Michael Heimbinder has been very active in the Newtown Creek Alliance, but doesn't live in the neighborhood. But um, the stories told, even at the informational meetings, really upset people. Laura Hoffman's an extremely articulate narrator, and her story is devastating. And I did have a student who did
didn't continue with the project, after going to one of those meetings, she went home and sobbed. And she lived in the neighborhood and really, um, it was hard to deal with. And Rachel and I had an interesting conversation at the project's end about how we dealt with it, which was basically remembering and forgetting. And this is something that probably people in the room who live in the area um, do. And, um, and so I wanted to ask Rachel about her position relative to this project. So this is an interview I did with her, not as part of the project, as part of my thinking about the project. I don't think I allow myself to think about it very much. The only time is when it hits me in the face, which is on a particular intersection walking back from the subway to my new apartment on Manhattan in East Williamsburg. And this one intersection, there's the worst smell. And it's not necessarily sewer, but it's sewer mixed with something else. And it's really bad, particularly in the summer. And every time I smell it, I'm like, hmm, kind of kind of makes me think there's something going on. Um, but then I walk away and my block smells great. So, so I, I'm okay with that again. And I don't have that, it's a residential area. I'm not near the industrial zone. So I feel that where I live is, is okay. As an outsider, it gives you, I mean, I was, I'm both an outsider and an insider. That's what it is. So I'm an outsider because I'm a newcomer. So I don't know the history and I was very interested in learning about that. But I'm an insider in the sense that I live here now, and I own property here, and I'm invested in living in this this neighborhood for conceivably a long time. I don't know. I guess I haven't thought enough about that, but I think it added both good and bad elements. But probably would have been a different project had I not been a resident here, mm -hmm. or been a long-term resident here. Perhaps I wouldn't have even wanted to do the project if I was a long-term resident. I don't know. But because it was so new and I hadn't heard anything about it, that, that was really, that was striking. And I thought that it should, more information should come to the surface. And who better to learn it from than these residents who have been here their whole lives. So I think it was a, a bit of a knowledge quest, a personal knowledge quest, in, addi in addition to one for the community. Okay, so when I got together with Rachel to debrief about the project, um, she had left Greenpoint, where she had been living on one of the plumes, but she had moved to East Williamsburg, one of the other three neighborhoods um, that's affected by Newtown Creek and the surrounding environmental burden. So she electively, as a property owner, bought something in East Williamsburg, and she was four months pregnant when we did this interview. So um, asked about her, um, well, I'll, I'll hold off on that. Um, you know, as a brief confessional, I could have been interviewed for this project. I fit the criteria, um, unlike Rachel, because I'd been in the neighborhood for more than 10 years at the time of this project. And yet, I really didn't want to make connections between my health problems and the toxins. And I do have an autoimmune disorder that was under control at the time that we were doing these interviews. And I didn't think it would be empowering or cathartic for me to speak about this and my questions I had about possible connection. I felt it would increase my anxiety. So I was helping to aggregate this broader sample, but I failed to see my own input as valuable contribution. In fact, I was kind of worried I would destroy the narrative because I thought um, I'm less sure of the connection between my health issues and where I lived all these years. And um, I thought people, the stories I was hearing, people were very sure and very clear. And at the same time, um, I appreciated that people were willing to make these connections, you know, because given all of my denial, Rachel's denial, it's very scary to even think about this. It's very scary to think that your environment has poisoned you. Um, and it leads to a lot of feelings of helplessness. It can. So to some degree, the project regulated our anxiety, I think, and our previous sense of helplessness. Um, looking back, um, I think I should have participated as an interviewee, if only to throw in with the interviewees. Um, and Rachel and I discussed uh, bias and neutrality and the fact that we all, we, all three of us thought there was definitely something going on and that the problems were definitely causing the health problems. So how did that affect the interviews and the way we drove the project? I definitely had an opinion on all these matters. I was, uh, my undergrad was in environmental health 
So I had studied environmental justice and toxic pollutants and all that stuff. And I, I knew there was a lot going on. And um, there was a power, power dynamic in the neighborhood with the, the experts and the state regulatory and city regulatory agencies versus the community members, you know, the lay people. And so I definitely had a bit of an agenda. And that's gonna show through, I'm sure. How can that not impact a project? But at the same time, trying to understand more about the context of the community and not just the problems in the community was a way, I think, of getting a more holistic picture. Okay. Um, so, okay, now we're going to get to solutions or recommendations. So for those of you who are looking to use this as a model or just use oral history in a public health context, I hope that some of these recommendations and our wistful, you know, things we wish we had done will be helpful to you. Um, okay, so <coughs> conducting a needs assessment early on in the process, this was Rachel's idea that she thinks looking back that even signing contracts with community partners would be a good idea so we can find out very early on how can you help with this project, how many hours do you have, what kind of jobs would you be interested in taking on, and this was especially an issue when it came time to disseminating the reports. It had been very ambiguous who was going to do that. So Rachel thought Newtown Creek Alliance was going to do that. They didn't think they were going to do that. So who is going to help you do what? What is available to you? Um, the timing of the training is important. So if we had conducted the training later, people were ready to go. After the training, I feel like if they had had an interview scheduled two days later, the project would have gone off with its original design. But if you have a recorder and you've never used it before, this is a recorder, and maybe you've never even recorded anything before, and then someone calls you six weeks later to say, do you wanna do an interview and you don't even have the equipment in your home, it's very intimidating, and so I think the training should have been done closer to the time of the scheduled interviews. But it, the project was evolving so much because we were figuring out who was our research team and would they buy in, and then once they bought in, well, who are our interviewees? But they should have interviewed each other, like the next day. So um, I recommend that you time your trainings very close to the time of your interviews. The journalist problem. So this seems really easy to solve now. Uh, you should identify people early who are willing to be media contacts. And that can even be on the release form. Um, so, or it can be asked after, or it can be a separate release form, but, um, identifying people ahead of time, and when someone calls you, I'm sorry, that person is not interested in being a media contact. Uh, outreach, so um, outreach should be assigned the most time, effort, and budget. It's just, it's the foundation of your project, and it's more important to compensate people who have doors shut in their faces than people who added audio, purely because of the risk um, involved. So, um, Next, stopping to reflect on successes as you re rework your project design. You might think you're doing this, if, for those of you involved in projects, but you might not be. Because I think that some conversations, you talk about stuff that's going well, stuff about, that's not going well, but often the conversation turns to stuff that's not going well. Setting aside a separate conversation where you only talk about what's going well, it's not just a morale boost, which it is, but it also helps you play to the project strengths, which you're varying by always talking about the problems. So what are the strengths? What is going well? And how can we expand that? How can we play to our project strengths as it organically changes? Um, lastly, legal. So we decided not to interview anyone involved in the class action lawsuit because we could not get satisfactory answers. And um, I wasn't satisfied with the solution because I thought it was the best one given that we couldn't get answers, but um, more recently an environmental lawyer at the Newtown Creek Alliance let me know that law firms are interested in pro bono work, especially this time where they won't have to go to court, and she felt that counseling on these kinds of issues might be appealing to them. So she promised to put me in touch with a few people. So knowing that's a possibility might help you. Um, okay, so um, outcomes of the project, both the map and the report were made available in September 2010, which was timed um, to be released simultaneously to coincide with the announcement that Newtown Creek was finally designated a Superfed site. So um, once that happened, people were suddenly researching Newtown Creek. It was in the New York Times. It was, you know, it was everywhere. So 
the idea was that it would generate some buzz and people would find this map. Um, the particular group of narratives were given the name Creek Speak because we had to name our map on Habitat Map and a logo was designed. Um, two months later, two of the lawsuits were settled and the last I knew the third was pending in discovery. So um, a lot happened in three months after years of spaces. Um, so for me, um, the project is an example of investigators working across several fields and bringing together the language, method, and resources of various fields. And including this emergent possibility of mapping, which I think is of increasing interest to oral historians. And the original goal was to galvanize these three disparate communities um, by having them interview one another. And although that wasn't accomplished in that form, I do think that East Williamsburg and Maspeth are now included in the wider conversation about the creek and about environmental hazards. So I do feel like we were able to expand the map a little and change the dialogue because people typically talk about Greenpoint, Greenpoint, Greenpoint. Um, okay, so I want to um, wrap up um, by just talking about questions I'm left with, which are really, I hope, a way to start our conversation. So these are questions I'm left with. I don't have the answers. Um, so when you're starting a community conversation, how can you build a flexible project so it can continue to grow without its original leadership? So by the time Rachel needs to move on or I need to move on, how, what do people that, that still want to talk? What if they call next week? Who is there to listen to them, to add their voices to the project? So building in as part of your project design a way, sort of a transmission of this project to another person, a community group, um, is important, I think, for if you, I think it's important. So what kinds of compromises are okay to strike when you and your project partners from other fields have different best practices? So for example, I don't use a script ever when I'm interviewing and doing a strictly oral history interview, but this went through an IRB at Hunter and Rachel had to hand them a script and the script had to be approved. So what do you do when you're each adhering to your best practices but they don't overlap perfectly? And that's been a really interesting challenge as I continue to work with other kinds of organizations and institutions, whether it's museums or um, a project like this. So this is something that comes up a lot. As an oral historian, how can you serve as a project partner but not feel like a house guest in someone else's home if embedded in another field or institution? So oral history is sometimes considered a subset of a project because it's a methodology. People don't realize it's a field. And um, oral history is considered a means to an end. So it kind of gets rolled in sometimes if you're working with project partners in, say, public health. Um, you know, you're a helping hand but how can you assert um, oral history values and oral history characteristics? And earlier tonight, um, with students, we were talking about the ethical practices of oral history, so how can we help and imbue these other fields with more ethical considerations? Um, so uh, lastly, this isn't on the slide, um, how can we be protective without being so cautious that we eliminate the risk but also the gain? So um, those of you who are working on difficult projects with either um, unloved narrators <laughs> or um, narrators who people think it's unethical to interview, um, this question is really important. So of course we want to do no harm, um, but we also don't want to ignore entire populations because it's hard to figure out how to interview them, I, especially children um, and minors, I think, it's, yes, there are complicated issues, but we need to hear from people under 18, right? So a lot of people, um, this is um, something I'm really interested in. How can we be protective without being too cautious and kind of silencing entire groups of people? So I'm going to stop there.